Hi everyone, I'm Erin and I'm currently working here at UVA and Professor Focus is my advisor for my thesis project and the work centers on the relationship between U.S. and um, Chinese media and technology companies and uh, the new books come along with it in China and that's what we're going to be talking about today. It comes out next February, so look for that and um, Professor Focus. Erin is actually doing a really cool project that focuses on uh, the role that independent or that short films have on um, the careers of independent filmmakers. So another bright media studies scholar to watch. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about the relationship between Hollywood and China and outlining a, a large part of my, of my forthcoming book, but also talking about some of the stakes for what it means in the context of the growth of the global media industries that China's role is becoming so much more prominent uh, for American consumers as well as for global consumers. Uh, so just to kind of give you a perspective on why this is an important question, why Hollywood's relationship with China is so important. So in, by 2018, China is slated to have the largest film market in the world. This is a conservative estimate for that number. So we have, um, so when thinking about these, when thinking about these issues, there is a possibility that China's market will actually exceed the U.S. market in size by 2016, by the end of 2016, um, though actually this year the Chinese market has been a little bit smaller. Now what does this mean? Hollywood has had this dominant position in the global media industries essentially since, uh, essentially since the beginning of the motion picture industry, and now we're seeing this significant sea change between the role of Hollywood and its nearest competitor, which is now China. Now this has happened very, very quickly. China's media market has grown 30% year over year since 2011. And at the same time, Hollywood and the US, the US theatrical box office has remained relatively stagnant at a rate of roughly one to 2% growth per year. Now this is a lot of money that we're talking about. So U.S. film exports to China were worth over U.S. over two billion dollars in a market in the Chinese market valued at 6.8 billion dollars in 2015, and actually this number of two billion dollars is with a lot of trade controls that I'll be talking about. So actually, this number, the amount of money that Hollywood generates in China, could actually be substantially higher uh, with changes in with changes in Chinese policy. Now the Chinese market is projected to be to rise to increase to 10 billion in 2016. So if you think about the increases in those numbers from 6.8 billion to 10 billion, we're talking about huge, huge increases and a, a very large amount of capital that's being infused into the market uh, with the attendant potential for, for growth for Hollywood. Now Hollywood needs the Chinese market. Why? So, most studios, most Hollywood studios are now actually owned by global media conglomerates, global technology conglomerates, and those, those companies are publicly traded entities which have to report their quarterly income, um, and their stock prices are dependent on continuous growth. Now, because of the relative stagnance of the U.S. theatrical box office, and because of the relative growth of the Chinese box office, what this means is that in order to continue they're, in order to continue maintaining their share prices, in order to compete with, with other global competitors, Hollywood media conglomerates must, actually, must collaborate with Chinese partners and must be able to enter the Chinese market. Now, that's not an easy prospect, and there are, there are a lot of potential, potential minefields along the way. Now, what we see over here is really, we can start to appreciate the importance of, of the international box office for Hollywood studios. So if you look here, we see in 2011, $32.6 billion was the total size of the market with a total of $10.2 billion in the international market. Now this number is the same as what, is roughly the same as what the Chinese market is projected to contribute to the global box office in 2016. Similarly, we see that there's this, we see the year over year growth, the percentage change in the, in the significance of the international box office. Um, is much more is much more significant is much greater than that of the international box office in total. So nine percent versus twenty one percent, and these are figures. These figures are publicly available from the Motion Picture Association of America. Similarly, if we look at if we look at the percentage of global box office, 
Asia Pacific has become, has become a significantly greater percentage of the total global box office from 2011 to 20, or 2015, or 20, from 2011 to 2015. We also see that China is the number one international box office, UK number two, Japan number three. Um, but really, there's, it's important to note that, that huge distance between the number one and the number two. So, um, so China is really, really kind of head and, head and tail, heads and tails above its, its nearest competitor in that respect. So again, when we think about this, Hollywood needs the Chinese market. But, at the same, but by the same token, China doesn't need Hollywood in quite the same way. And more importantly, as it stands, there are really significant limitations to access for American companies trying to enter the Chinese market. Now, China is a member of the World Trade Organization, which technically accrued, which technically allows for foreign companies to enter its market, other WTO member states to enter its market to participate within the Chinese, within the Chinese market openly. However, since 2001, this has not actually been the case, and this has not really been what we've seen in terms of the opening of the Chinese market. Now, there are reasons for this, and unlike automotive production or unlike toy production, cultural production has a different type of significance for governments and, um, and for the people of countries. So historically, in trade agreements, there have been things called cultural exceptions. So in the, the general agreement, uh, um, so in the GATS and um, the GATT treaties, there were cultural exemptions for countries that want to protect their, their cultural patri patrimony. And this is, this is the rationale through it, uh, by which China has limited access to its market. That being said, um, there really has been a very slow pace of growth in terms of the, the type of access that foreign firms have to the Chinese film market in particular. So in two, prior to 2001, 10 foreign films were allowed to be imported into the Chinese market. After 2001, that number increased to 20, even though the negotiated number in the WTO accession agreement was actually 50. Now, in 2007, the United States, um, through, the, through the WTO, made a complaint against China, um, and for five years negotiated with Chinese partners through the WTO, leading to, in 2012, an agreement called the U.S.-China Film Agreement between, uh, that, was, that was negotiated by U.S. Vice President Joe Biden and Chinese Vice President, uh, then Chinese Vice President Xi Jinping, called the U.S.-China Film Agreement. And through the U.S.-China Film Agreement, the, the quota number was increased from 20 to 34. Now again, that's still not 50. And as we have seen in, in Xi Jinping, in Chinese President Xi Jinping's interactions in a lot of global contexts, he's a very savvy and skilled negotiator, um, and also reluctant to be pressured by, by foreign, by foreign uh, forces. But even this 34 film number is slightly misleading, in the sense that it really also strongly benefited the Chinese domestic box office. So for those 20 films, 20 fil those 20 films are 2D films. So 2D films tend to be narrative feature films, dramas, uh, romances, comedies. But those additional 14 films were all designed to be special format films. So 3D films or IMAX. Now, the reason that this this uniquely benefited the Chinese, the Chinese market was because at that time, in 2012, there was a huge, a huge growth in the number of 3D theaters and the number of IMAX theaters, the number of digital theaters that were in the Chinese market. So as a result, those additional 14 films didn't compete necessarily with Chinese domestic 2D films, those dramas and those comedies, but did fill up spaces in those new 3D theaters and those new IMAX theaters and generated a lot of additional revenue for those, for those spaces. Now, one of the other really significant parts of this is 3D and IMAX films uh, tend to require higher ticket prices as well. So, whereas one might pay in a Chinese, in a Chinese theater $14 or $15 to go to, I know it's, it's a very expensive, um, it's an expensive market, $14 or $15 to go to a to a film in a Chinese multiplex, going to an IMAX film or a 3D film could be $25 or $28.
And given the fact that Chinese film distributors took a, took, take a percentage of every film, of every film's distribution revenue in the Chinese market, that also meant infusing additional revenue for Chinese distribution companies. So even as we see this quota increasing from 20 to 34, there's still, there are still some questions about uh, whether or not that was the most equitable way. Because now there are limitations to the type of films that are available within, within the Chinese market um, in addition to these, in addition to these, um, to these, to this film quota. So we have pirated films. Now pirated films are, are available in a lot of Chinese contexts, so you can get pirated DVDs or, pi or films that are distributed on online platforms. Now, while this does allow the intellectual property of, uh, allow brands, Hollywood brands to build, um, those studios and media conglomerates cannot take those, cannot take the revenue from those pirated films and put them into their, into their balance sheets to enhance their, their stock prices. Um, then we have these imported films. And then finally, uh, film co-productions. Now, co-productions are an interesting phenomenon that I'll talk a little bit about, I'll talk about a little bit more, but bears, uh, bears a brief introduction. So film co-productions are collaborations between Chinese and American, and American studios that are overseen by the state administration of press, publication, radio, film, and television. And what this means is they can be treated as local films within the Chinese market, so they can circumvent that, that film quota. By the same token, they're also treated as foreign films outside of China. So while they don't have to deal with the film import process, they do ultimately um, have to, they do ultimately have to get kind of continuous approval from Chinese regulators from the pre-production process through production all the way through distribution. So there's frequently in Hollywood a lot of debate about whether and who gets the final cut approval. Is it the director? Is it the producer? In the context of co-productions, actually, the regulators get final approval, and that's a that's a really significant change, um, a significant change in the power dynamic. Now, when we're thinking about this 34 film quota, this is what it is as it stands right now. 34 films, but it's not only 34 Hollywood films. This is an important thing to remember. This can also include Japanese films, Korean films, Latin American films, European films. And as a result, actually regulators with this 34 film quota can influence the size of the box office. They can influence the relative power of different global film industries. So by choosing to by choosing to import Hollywood films, uh, for example, a blockbuster spectacle. So The Legend of Tarzan was one of the films that was in the 34 film quota this summer, our, our finest cultural, cultural product. Um, that, actually had, that actually infused additional cash into the Chinese box office, so made that number, made that total box office number look bigger. Now, if there if there wasn't that interest in making, if there wasn't that interest in making that box office number look bigger on behalf, on behalf of the regulators, they could also also choose smaller films that wouldn't necessarily generate the same level of revenue. The other thing that's significant to note about this 34 film quota is that actually it has an expiration date. So that U.S.-China film agreement was only for five years. So the agreement began to take effect although it wasn't in 2012 although it wasn't officially signed until 2015 and it expires in February 2017 so this information is is information to watch if this is an area that you're interested in because ultimately right now the motion picture associate the stakeholders involved in this 34 film quota the motion picture association of america the us trade representative the Chinese State Administration of Press, Publication, Radio, Film, and Television, the Ministry of Culture, they're all in the process of renegotiating this quota. And it's, it's, it's unclear what will happen. It could go down, it could go up, um, so, so we'll see. But what this ultimately does is really, again, shift the balance of power away from Hollywood and shift it in the direction of incentivizing U.S. producers to make more of their content in China in order to avoid having to deal with this very precarious import quota. So processes like co-production become more attractive. Though as I'll talk about later in this, as I'll talk about later in this talk, they're still a little bit, they still are very precarious in themselves. Now in addition to the, in addition to the US theatrical market, the, the TV market is also highly regulated. So foreign corporations cannot own TV stations. 
uh, the Disney Channel cannot own a cannot own a Disney Channel in China. It's illegal. Um, streaming content has to be reviewed by the season rather than by the episode. So, for example, um, if a if a if a studio wants to export their content, they have to export they have to export an entire season, which both which delays the potential for distribution. It also creates fewer opportunities for a course correction along the way. So, if regulators don't like the entire season, then they have less opportunity to, sh to shift things around. Then there's actually a limit on the number of hours of foreign TV that can play on Chinese stations. So when we're looking at this, even if you get through the fact, even if your content is, um, is approved, there's still the limitation on the fact that you're competing with other foreign television, with, all, with other foreign TV in order to be distributed on Chinese stations. In addition to foreign content, we're also looking at regulations on foreign platforms. So a platform would be like the structure of a reality TV show. Um, so The Amazing Race, China Rush, or The Voice of China, for example, are two popular, two popular platforms that have recently been discredited by Chinese regulators because, they're, because, of, the type of, because of the type of foreign influence that they have. So in order to manage this type of risk, there's increasing incentive for Hollywood studios and for media conglomerates to really look at ways that they can make their content in China in order to be able to avoid these contentious issues with the export of content to China. How does it happen and what does it ultimately mean? So one of the ways that this happens is co-production, as, as we discussed earlier. Now, co-production is not merely just a rubber stamp. There's actually a lot of involvement by, by uh, the state administration of press, publication, radio, film, and television through the entire process. Co-productions are administered by the um, China Film Co-Production Corporation, which looks at a script at the very beginning, so in the pre-production process, assessing whether or not a specific type of product is viable. Um, it, Sends people to the um, sends people to the production, so the production location, going on set, seeing what's happening, and again has this final cut approval. In addition to that, we're looking at things like um, the number of it requires a certain number of Chinese uh, Chinese actors to be in in a co-production. There needs to be a certain amount of Chinese financing, and again, there are there are fixed there are fixed numbers for these, but I'm, I'm hesitant to say them because they actually really do change according to the contract agreements per production. So while there are official numbers uh, in terms of the, the number of, of actors and the amount of financing, those, those numbers actually aren't, aren't accurate in terms of how it, how it really plays out. Um, but what ultimately is important to note is that regulators have the final say in terms of whether or not there are enough Chinese actors, whether or not there's enough Chinese content in a particular co-production, whether or not there's enough Chinese financing. Um, so this can, this can really start to shape the way in which a production looks. It's an additional stakeholder beyond the directors and the producers and the financing companies. So ultimately, Sino-Foreign co-productions are these contractual arrangements between a foreign party and a Chinese party to conduct filming in China and to be treated as local films. So there may be multiple parties on each side. Um, but they all must be accredited, accredited by the state administration of press, publication, radio, film, and television. So what does that mean in term, from, a, from a realistic perspective? When, you're, when one is dealing with a Chinese regulator and trying to make a product, there are certain, there are certain ideas or certain topics that already sound unappealing. So, so for example, films about Tibet, films about, the Tianan, films about Tiananmen Square, films about Taiwan. When we're looking at issues like this, Already, this, this de-incentivizes any, any producer who's trying to take advantage of the world's second largest, potentially largest market, to even consider making something about those topics. Because historically, they, have been, they haven't been approved um, and are regularly censored on, uh, on Chinese websites, etc. Well, but it's not just that. And sometimes this happens in a slightly, in a slightly funnier way. So I'm going to give you an example of, of another film, um, of an official Sino-US co-production from the beginning of this decade. Uh, it's called in Chinese, Go Chun. But as you can see now from the trailer, uh, I'll just play it. Maybe some of you will know this film. 
Sorry about the audio quality. So you'll notice Hawaii Brothers, Shanghai Media Group. So one of the things that's significant about this, and this is the last type of film that one might think would have adjustments made um, by regulators, but actually it, it's kind of the classic example of how this idea of Hollywood made in China can really start to transform media culture. So oh, Qingtun is actually means um, the singing, dancing youth. So we've kind of eliminated this whole idea of high school, and there is a very specific strategic reason for that. So in high school, Chinese students are not supposed to be doing things like singing and dancing and participating in musical theater. Um, and this was, this was notes from the, from the regulators. So they should instead be studying for their exams, for their college entrance exams. Similarly, this is a very romantic story about high school students engaged in, um, in courtship and relationships. And again, this is the sort of, this is not allowed for, um, this is not allowed or dis discouraged for Chinese high school students. So in order to get this film past, uh, past regulators, instead they had to change the setting to be in a professional academy for theater and dance so that the students were already past the high school phase, so that they were older, and also so that they weren't trying to get into college. So they wouldn't, it wouldn't you know, dissuade, um, dissuade young people from, uh, from focusing on their studies. Now again, this is a minor example, but I'll kind of be talking through how these adjustments really play out on a larger scale. Now, the, the case of High School Musical China was one in which it was, it was possible to actually make that adjustment, and the film actually didn't do that well in China. It was, it was part of a larger, larger effort by Disney to make co-productions around the, around the world. There was also a High School Musical Mexico, uh, which also you know, only had kind of mild success. Um, so, but at least Disney was able to kind of complete that co-production. There are a lot of films that start off as, in this co-production process that fail, um, that actually don't make it through that regulatory process. And instead of, instead of actually having this opportunity to access the market um, freely, they receive notes from regulators throughout the entire process, but instead are then um, are then required to go through the import process. So now faux productions are projects that, while beginning as official Chinese co-productions, ultimately do not pass production approval one or more times and have to instead, after getting feedback from Chinese regulators at the pre-production process, at the production process, then have to again go through the import process if they want to enter the, the market. So this is an example of a Sino-US faux production a film that started as a co-production, but ultimately had to shift out and, was, and entered the Chinese market through the, through the import process. So when we're looking at films that have Chinese bureaucratic imprint, it's rather surprising to see which ones they are sometimes. Um, so Iron Man 3 was a co-production through much of its life, um, all, all the way through May, uh, all the way through the month before it was distributed. Chinese regulators visited the production. Um, they were involved in the pre-production process. But ultimately, and this is um, most likely due to issues of financing, so insufficient levels of Chinese financing in relation to US financing, and also due to issues of content, um, lack of Chinese content. The film lost its co-production approval and was exported to China as part of the, the 34 film quota. But this isn't the only way. So entering the market through film co-production and through television production, as I have mentioned before, is really very dicey and it's precarious and it, it relies on quick decisions of regulators who don't necessarily have a huge amount of financial investment uh, in the outcome of the process. Now, one of the things that we see in terms of the growth of, in terms of the growth of studio, of studio production and as a way to build ancillary income in the Chinese market is this idea of brandscapes. 
So essentially taking the brand that would normally have been distributed through a film or through a television product and instead creating a corporate space through which to, to draw ancillary income um, within the market, something more permanent. So according to Anna Klingman, brandscapes are the physical manifestations of synthetically conceived identities transposed onto synth synthetically conceived places, demarcating culturally independent sites where corporate value systems materialize into physical territories. Now this is rather a mouthful, but one, the thing that I want you to focus on here is corporate value systems materializing into physical territories. So in a context where it's difficult to get a, specific, a film through, lar larger capital investments actually with Chinese partners who are financially invested and that don't necessarily have to go through this film, go through film regulators, are a way in which Hollywood studios can enter the Chinese market and take advantage of the growth of the market without having to, without having to worry about um, the, the various machinations of regulators. What you see in front of you is the Disney Magic English class. Here we have a foreign teacher, Chinese students. Disney Magic English started in 2005 four years after China's accession to the World Trade Organization, after Disney had tried to purchase their own television station in China. Um, as you can notice in the back, we see 101 Dalmatians here. Um, students are learning English. So following 2001, there was a huge push to enhance English language education within the Chinese market. Uh, and because there were relative, relatively stringent regulations on the growth of the Chinese market, uh, on the, Chinese, the growth of the Chinese media market in other ways, Disney actually circumvented this by opening up English schools that served as screening rooms. Now, ultimately what this does is make Chinese children aware of this brand in a way that helps to prime the pump for potential future, potential future projects. And one of those potential future projects was Shanghai Disney Resort, um, the, which was agreed upon in 2009, eventually was opened in June 2016, and again, much like the Shanghai, much like the Disney English schools, offers an opportunity for the company to recoup ancillary income from, um, or offers the company to, a com an opportunity to recoup income from the market without having to rely exclusively on things like the, like the film and television market. And as you can see, this is part of a larger strategy to link larger investments in the Chinese market with film production, like things such as, um, such as Disney High School Musical. Um, Disney was also um, an, an investor in Iron Man 3. Now, Disney isn't the only company that's doing this. Uh, and what we're seeing is this movement of large companies, particularly large family entertainment companies, to enhance their operations in China, uh, both in production but also in other areas. So Kung Fu Panda had a huge box office in China in 2008, uh, and then in 2012 it also was, was extremely successful. During that same year, we saw the opening or the establishment of Oriental DreamWorks, their translation, not mine. Um, and this is, we see Jeffrey Katzenberg, partners from China Media Capital, the Shanghai Media and Entertainment Group, uh, working together to establish a domestic Chinese production facility in Shanghai uh, to make Chinese content for global audiences. This is part of the Shanghai Dream Center, which again, like Disney Shanghai Resort, is, a, is an integrated media and entertainment property. Now the first project of, or one of the first major projects of Kung Fu, one of the first major projects of Disney Shanghai Resort was, or of um, Kung Fu Panda, or I'm sorry, Oriental DreamWorks, was this film that you may recognize. And I'll just play the visuals so you can see while I'm talking. So one of the things that was most interesting about this case of Kung Fu Panda 3 is it's technically a film co-production, as we discussed earlier, but between a DreamWorks subsidiary and DreamWorks, so it's the Chinese subsidiary uh, is working with DreamWorks. Now one of the other things that's really interesting 
is the way that they structured the film was such that the voice tracks and the visuals match. So there are Chinese voice tracks and Chinese visuals that look like the characters are speaking in Mandarin, English voice tracks and English visuals that look like the characters are speaking in English. Uh, so they're really taking advantage of this medium of animation. Moreover, if we note this, we are also avoiding these pernicious questions of race and the race and nationality of the characters. So we don't have to worry, oh, you know, who's, where's the Chinese character, where's the American ca character, these kind of regulatory issues. Um, and also, because it's a family film, we see there are these issues of sex or violence or politics that might, that might dog other types of films are not present. Now, Jerry Seinfeld once said, there's no such thing as fun for the whole family. And I think that this is a really great example of this happening. So on one hand, we see this great, great financial success where it's wonderful, DreamWorks made a ton of money, Chinese government and Chinese people were very happy about a film like Kung Fu Panda representing uh, this kind of significant cultural, cultural moment. By the same token, if all films made for the global marketplace start to resemble Kung Fu Panda, um, you know, with the flattening out of issues of sex and of violence and of politics, we're really in for we're really in for a lot of trouble. I mean, this is not this is not a, a direction that uh, that as scholars of media or cultural studies we want the we want the global marketplace to take. Um, so ultimately, while Kung Fu Panda was a success and does offer a model for certain types of certain types of filmmakers, it also draws some really significant questions. If this is the type of film that we're looking toward making, if this is what happens when Hollywood is made in China, what are we missing out on? And here are a couple of examples of small changes that have been made along the way to films um, as a result of either co-production activity or film import activity that show that we're really, we really are starting to see these changes. So for example, in Iron Man 3, British actor Ben Kingsley played the Mandarin in, in the film, and again, I'm not advocating for you know, these yellow peril characters to show up where the, you know, the, the Mandarin who was showing up as the nemesis of Iron Man should be a Chinese character. But the fact that the, the race of the character was changed in the film is a significant change to note. And again, it may have been as a result of uh, an effort to make the film, to update the film and make it more, more sensitive for the 21st century. It may have also been a gesture to the Chinese regulatory agencies or both. Similarly, we see um, in the upcoming Doc Dr. Strange film, Tilda Swinton uh, plays, is going to play the character of the Ancient One who was originally Tibetan. Again, this idea of a, an aged Ancient One who's played by a, a mysterious culture in Tibet is you know, problematic in, its, in itself. But the fact that the race, was, the race was changed as part of an effort to export the film to China or the, the race and ethnicity were changed, is, is something worth noting, at least. Um, in World War Z, the origins of a zombie-making disease were changed from being made in China. Uh, so no zombies can come from China anymore. Uh, in Mission Impossible 3, filmmakers had to cut images of dirty laundry hanging in a Shanghai street. Uh, in Skyfall, filmmakers had to delete scenes in which uh, James Bond kills a Chinese security guard. Um, and this one is actually my favorite, because this really shows the kind of parallel worlds that, um, that Hollywood and the US government are operating in, in many ways. So in Gravity and in The Martian, uh, Chinese, Chinese astronauts save a stranded US astronaut. And if we just take one brief look at the relationships between the US Navy and the Chinese Navy in the South China Sea, and then look at this level of cooperation in, uh, you know, between Chinese and US astronauts, the, the improbability of this really starts to just pop out. Um, and granted, actually, in The Martian, the original narrative had Chinese astronauts saving, um, saving the main character, but this, this was an uh, addition in gravity. So we're, we're seeing these kind of structural changes, and to be honest, this, I find this more interesting. I don't find it as bothersome, um, but I think it is worth taking note of this, these adjustments in our, in our media culture. Um, but what I think is slightly more, more interesting and potentially more, more troubling is the way in which the, the importance of the Chinese market has ultimately started to change the structure of the global media industries um, on a macro level. 
So for example, um, Chinese firm Wanda is poised to own the majority of US theatrical, oh, uh, that should read AMC, um, theatrical distribution capacity through its acquisitions of AMC and Carmike. So that means that in addition to theatrical, controlling theatrical distribution in the US, uh, a Chinese firm will control the majority of theatrical distribution, or in China, a Chinese firm will control the majority of theatrical distribution in the US. Uh, if the Carmike acquisition goes through, and that's not, that's not certain. Similarly, Wanda acquired US, US Studio Legendary Pictures, so we're seeing studio acquisition activity, um, and then China's Perfect World Pictures is putting together a film slate with Universal. Uh, Huawei Brothers has agreed to a film slate deal with STX Entertainment. So these are kind of larger structural changes that are occurring as a result of the really, uh, the really significant need that um, Hollywood studios and entertainment companies have in order to be able to access the Chinese markets. So there's a lot of openness to collaboration, which is, which is positive in a lot of ways, but also has the potential to really, to really flatten out what is available uh, in global media culture. And I've highlighted a lot of the regulatory issues that are present in China, but this is not to say by any means that the corporate media culture that pervades Hollywood doesn't also do a lot of this. So uh, when we're talking about the types of stories that don't get made, some of them do deal with regulatory issues in China, but some of them are also as a result of this, of this profit motive of Hollywood studios. So there's a reason why half of the films that I showed you are sequels of something, and it's because they're much more predictable when trying to, when trying to predict revenue for, for studios. So the lack of a flattening out of the type of content that's available isn't strictly the result of Chinese regulatory issues. It also has a lot to do with uh, US, corporate cult US corporate culture. That being said, the two forces combined have the potential to create a rather strange global media scape for us as we move forward in the 21st century. Uh, and, and with that, I'm going to leave you with, with one final example of the type of thing that we're starting to see. And this is a this is made by Legendary. Um, it started off as a co-production, uh, but after Legendary was acquired by Wanda, its status um, has slightly changed. Um, but anyway, but what I'd like to leave, the message I'd li like to leave you with is that making entertainment locally in China is really the only way for Hollywood to maximize its global market. And that Hollywood made in China is increasingly Hollywood made for China. But this may be what we ultimately see. Matt Damon on the Great Wall. I couldn't have written this <laughs> if I was choosing an example <laughs> to talk about the potential problems with this new with this new frame of with this new phase of collaboration. This is the sort of thing that I would have thought up in my mind. So we have a major Hollywood star in a completely anachronistic context on the Great Wall with monsters. So when we're thinking about this issue of the ways in which our media culture is changing as a result of China's growth, it's important to think about the ways in which these changes have already happened. So thank you very much for your time and attention, and I welcome any questions you may have. I have a, I'd love to talk with you more about this, so please ask anything you'd like. Thank you. Thank you.